speaking from an AFL sort of background, I've noticed at the moment they're trying to limit uh, rotations uh, through the bench and things like that. Obviously, from a injury prevention perspective, from what I can gather, now obviously they're trying to reduce the speed of the game, which then they can say that then there's going to be less collisions and therefore less of those types of injuries. However, from um, I guess uh, my background, I would have thought that having more fatigue in the body would then lead to mm -hmm. further musculoskeletal injuries. Would you be able to explain that a little uh, bit for us? That, that, it, it's a very good question because uh, this was a very hot topic of debate three or four years ago when the AFL were looking into limiting the rotations, the, their rationale behind why they wanted to do that. Um, the, their argument was, uh, as you said, um, was to um, reduce the speed of the game uh, and therefore the follow-on was to reduce the incidence of injury and that created a lot of debate because uh, certainly amongst the, the fitness and medical professionals um, there, were, there was a lot of argument as to, you know, did this re was this really the reason for doing it? Uh, some people thought it was for the image of the game. Um, since they have brought in the rotation limitations, um, the, yes, the, the speed of the game has slowed down, um, but the incident of injury, it, it's, the problem is it's still too early to tell whether it actually has had an impact on particularly soft tissue injuries, as you say. The, the, the theory was more fatigue, therefore there'd be a higher incidence of hamstring and calf and quadriceps strains. Now, we haven't had the new system in long enough to know whether that is in fact the case. Um, I think we're going to need at least another two or three more seasons uh, now that the rotations have been capped to see whether there has been an impact. My gut feeling is I don't think it'll change dramatically because like everything in, in sport, as soon as there is a rule change, the coaches, the fitness staff, the players, they just do things a little bit differently uh, to try and uh, adapt to the new rule. So the instance of the injury may well not change as a result of this rule. Um, I think we haven't quite actually uh, determined that yet. Is it possible to stop changing rules? Would that help? Stop changing rules. <laughs> uh, it seems to be a new one every year. Um, yeah, look, I, I agree. I mean, you, you don't want to be changing rules just for the sake of changing rules. And, and also, the, the, the problem with, you know, if we stick to injury, um, the, the problem with this area is that um, it takes a long time to get an idea of what a trend is in relation to how injuries change. Um, and you, know, you tend to get a bit of a knee-jerk reaction that, oh, last year there were too many hamstrings, so let's change the rules. Whereas it may have just been a minor aberration. I mean, at the moment, again, if you're aware of the, a, uh, the AFL injury survey, they're talking about cruciate lig ligament injuries now increasing their ugly heads again, whereas uh, 10 years ago they were reducing. And so now they're asking, well, why are we getting more cruciate ligament injuries and why are the people who have already had a cruciate reconstruction re-injuring their cruciates? And so I'm hoping that there's not going to be just some knee-jerk reaction, oh, well, let's change the rules um, to accommodate this uh, new injury incidence. Um, it, it goes far deeper than that. So I, I think we need to just um, take a bit of a deep breath and uh, keep an eye on the, the statistics for a little while longer yet. I'd like to come in on the statistics because yeah. this is an area where I do a lot of the work. You mentioned the AFL injury survey. And the AFL Injury Survey defines an injury as something that leads to a player to miss a game. Yeah. Now, you'd know that the fatigue injuries, you can still play a game. That's right. You know, it's what happens outside. But we're starting to see a, a, a move within AFL and other um, international sports bodies that's saying, hey, it's these overuse injuries and the ones that have long-term and chronic pain, they're just as important. And so we're starting to see new injury data collections around the world, and we will in the AFL, that starts to get at that. And I think that the issue you've said is probably going to be one of the areas that we have more growth in in terms of research over the next couple of years. And it also relates very importantly to our monitoring of training loads and how much um, players train, what sort of training they do and in what ratio, because it's more likely to impact on those fatigue and those um, non-game injuries than it is on the game injuries per se. The presenters have said that coaches need to have proper training. As a parent, how do I know whether the coach has had proper training? What qualifications am I looking for? Yeah. Okay, so coaches undergo accreditation and it goes from a level one, two or three. At the elite level where Mark is, all the coaches would be level three coaches yeah. and you wouldn't get anyone underneath that. That would be very rare at community sport. Um, the higher level senior competitions would have a level 
two accredited coach, but for junior sport, you really should be looking at people who've got level one accreditation. It's a, a you know, it's a challenge when we're looking at junior sport when, you know, you take your child to the team and, and people say, we need to have a coach for the team. Will someone volunteer? But I think there's an onus on the clubs and, again, the push from the parents to make sure that someone does have that accreditation. There is, in, in some sports, I think football and cricket is uh, uh, examples where there's level zero coaching. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but it's just an introduction to the game. But really, if you want to have attention to the safety principles and really the issues to do, like I mentioned before, about the appro appropriate age and, and size matching on teams and things, you really need to have um, level one coaches. And, you know, I think that we probably need a groundswell. You know, when you go to a team and choose it for your child, as I did when I moved to, to Ballarat where I live, you know, I rang around and I checked out all the coaching and accreditation standards of all the different teams and I chose what team he was going to play on the basis of that. You know, we need to start, you know, voting with our actions and only enrol our, our children in the teams that have got those coaching standards and then we'll find all the others will come up to standard later on, I think. I agree. I, I think um, certainly the, and again in, in the AFL example, nearly all of the um, levels of football that are affiliated to AFL, so SNFL and then the amateur leagues and then their junior teams, um, because they are bound by the overall policy, are obliged to provide level one or two mm -hmm. coaches. And I think it's a given, although, mm -hmm. you know, don't be afraid to ask and check. Um, the, the, the level one, two levels that they um, get this uh, accreditation at, they do get these types of um, lectures and uh, sessions on injury prevention, injury management. First, they all they'll have to do first aid, because uh, I've spoken to a few of them. So yeah. they get exposed to forums like this, so they are aware of the very thing that we are all concerned about. So if you can feel confident that if you do have a level one or two coach involved in your um, child sporting team that they've had this basic training and they should should be aware of it. And the other personnel with that, of course, are the sports trainers yes. who do really know how to manage um, and assess injuries on site and decide when to go to a doctor too. So you really want to make sure that there are at least a couple of people who are trained in that. And that's really ideal for parents who want to support their, their team, don't want to do the coaching, don't want to be a team manager, but really go to an organisation like Sports Medicine Australia or the AFL Sports Trainers Association. And I think it's like maybe half a Saturday afternoon or something like that for training. And that really is a very good thing you can do for your child sport. Yes. Athletes, they take up uh, the sport to try and like become the strongest, become the fastest, that sort of thing. And then uh, as we look at their injuries and stuff like that, we try and modify the game so they prevent their injuries and stuff like that. But will there come a stage where we've deviated from the actual origins of the game? Mm. Well, I think that's where the debate is leading to now. And again, in, in the AFL experience, you get the former AFL players who are saying, look, it's not the game it used to be. Um, you know, it's, yeah, we're, we're all getting softer. You know, that, that toughness, that courage is not there anymore. Um, I sit on the sidelines uh, 10 metres from an AFL footballer, and believe me, they, it's still a tough sport. So I, I think that, again, the, the, the human endeavour will still win out in the end. Yes, we'll modify rules, we'll, we'll change things, but um, the human spirit will always find ways and means of getting around it. Um, so I, I think for those of the purists who, who, who love the sport for that part of it, um, I don't think you will forever be disappointed. Things will change somewhat, but um, I still think the true nature of sport will, will continue. Um, what do you think, Caroline? Well, I do too, and I think it really comes again to the issue about what elite and high-performance sport is and what sport is for the rest of us and for our children. 95% of us play sport for health, for fitness, for fun. And I think that we should be looking at it differently. And the rules and regulations that are in place for the general participation level, I think, should be there to protect the athlete and to allow them to both, as I said before, feel safe and also to be safe. At the elite level of the game, I think it's something something different and for people who are going down the talent pathways I think that there should be structures in place where they can actually push those physical boundaries because that's what that's what it's all about. I've heard conflicting information about warm-ups, cool-downs and stretching. What's the truth? <laughs> uh, um, warm-up. Uh, 
it, it used to be when I when I played sport, it was all about stretching. You, st you stretch every bit of muscle and tendon in the body, and it would stop you suffering any sort of injury from a hamstring to a strained back or whatever. Um, I think the, the while stretching is part of normal warm up, I think it has it has been overemphasised over the years, and so the significance of it is sort of diminished uh, over recent times. On the other hand, warm up as was presented in the um, uh, initial presentation, uh, is very important. Um, and it, it's almost like if you just think of your car on a cold morning trying to turn the ignition over, and it takes a little while to warm up and then you drive it for, for five or ten k's, and uh, but by the time the engine's nice and warm, it runs really smoothly. Well, the muscle is actually very similar. So I think warm-up is very essential to help reduce injury prevention. Cool down. Um, these days, um, you'll be aware that all the professional athletes, certainly at AFL, they go down the beach, they have a nice cold swim on a Sunday morning, they sit in the ice baths. There's no evidence to show that it actually prevents injury, but it's part of their recovery um, to get their bodies refreshed and ready for training during the week when they're very fatigued. So it's as much a psychological thing as it is a physical. There's no evidence to show that it reduces um, the incidence of injury. So of those three, the warm-up, I think, is, is, the, is the best. And I think it needs to be a sport-specific warm-up yep. too. Yep. I've just come back from the International Olympic Committee Conference in Monaco last month, and I'd say maybe two-thirds of the whole conference was talking about exercise training programs to prevent injuries. And these are typically undertaken before a game or at the start of a training session where players do certain types of exercises and skills. And that's to increase their strength, uh, look at their flexibility, but also to increase the control they have around their knees, for example, that might put them at risk of injury. And there's a, a big program that's got a lot of promotion around the world called FIFA 11 Plus. So it's 11 exercises that you do if, to prepare for soccer. Now, that is very specific to soccer, and it's looking at the risk of um, ACL or, or ligament injuries in the knees because that's very common in that sport. When we're talking about our football codes, yes, we have ACL injuries, but we also have groin injuries and hamstring injuries. And we've been working with the AFL over the past three years to develop a program uh, called Footy First. So this is now the warm-up program that all footy players should do before they start the game. And it's modelled on exactly what you know, Mark's players would do at Port Adelaide and the elite level, and we've turned it down into what's appropriate for community level. And certainly, there is lots of evidence that that does reduce injuries if you do the right warm-up. You mentioned underage, under-12 football, and I think underage sport works pretty well until you get up to that puberty stage, which varies, and you can get a little, very, a little boy mm -hmm. standing against a man who's shaving. Mm -hmm. um, is, are there more injuries at that level, and has there been thought of introducing something based more on size rather than age at that stage? Yeah, in the olden days, yeah, everything was done by your chronological age. And you're right that that's very um, different for different people. Now we do see the construction of teams, particularly in the competitive level, where it's looking at skills, cognitive development. So some children will have different spatial and awareness abilities than others, but also physical size. So we do find that coaching practice now takes those three into account. Uh, I, I remember too, you know, my son was, was a, a very good junior cricketer, but he was always small. And so his technique was very good, but he couldn't hit as far as the big kids who always got boundaries. You know, and it was very hard to coach him as a parent through to say, well, just wait until you're 17, then you'll perform better. Um, but a good coach knows how to do that and give the feedback to the child so that that can um, develop into still a long sporting career for them at the level that they want. The, the only other comment I'd add to that is that, I mean, you're quite right, um, that it, it seemed about the age of 14, 15, sort of mid-adolescence, where physically they start to mature and, and um, start to develop into uh, young adults. And it's about that age where things can start to go a little bit haywire. Um, the, 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 the more talented elite level of um, a young um, footballer or athlete at that level starts to think about aspiring to this sport as part of their future, whereas the others tend to sort of just are quite happy to play along. And so you're getting a you're getting a few diverging roads 
at, at whatever level they want to pursue. Um, uh, and the, the physical maturity at the same age can be very different. And that's where things, you know, it becomes very difficult to manage them all at the same chronological mm -hmm. age um, because they're all, they're all different body sizes and shapes. And, and um, male, female, I mean, you know, um, again, th there are lots of girls and boys who play sport together until they get to about that age and the, f the physical differences just become too much. Um, so it seems to be that middle teenage years where we haven't quite got the formula right regarding who wants to pursue elite level of sport and who just is happy just to play uh, along and um, um, be sport be part of their recreation but they don't take it too seriously. Um, and so I don't think we've quite got the mix right yet. I think it's harder in the school setting because that clearly is by age group. And I think for the children who do aspire or would like to play more sport, community sport is a way that does allow them to progress against different levels. So if they have got school sets or other physical capabilities, they do have the scope to play up a level. And that, I think, is probably what we should be doing. So encouraging community sport as well as the school sport for those ones. This is from Will ZV 12 from Twitter. He says that commentators call players courageous when they play through serious injuries. Is this courageous or is it stupid? Uh, well, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's both. I mean, uh, it is, it's probably courageous and it's probably stupid. But th this is the trouble with, um, with risk-taking behaviour generally, not, not just in sport. We, we all know that we take risks and it, it seems to... It's the, seems to be human nature, I think, that people take on certain activities um, because they love it, they love the thrill, um, you know, skydiving, um, uh, things, you know, snow skiing, it doesn't matter. There, there's a component to it that's it's thrilling and exciting and there's an element of danger to it and, and it's human nature that people challenge themselves um, to overcome their fears, to overcome an injury that they actually got to the end. And, um, I don't know if any of you watched, I watched the interview last night with the former Essendon player, and he, um, uh, he talked about getting through a game with an injury and how proud he felt uh, at the end of the game that I got through it. Now, yes, that's courageous, but he's probably sitting there now with his knee replacement thinking he was pretty stupid. So um, I, I think it's both. Um, and it's a question of determining when their courage becomes stupidity. I mean, there is a limit at which you think, now, now it is getting a bit ridiculous. Um, you are now being stupid. It's been a bit more than courageous. And that line, I think, is... Um, I don't think anyone can really define it. It has to be decided at an individual level, both, both by the individual and by their medical practitioner if they're dealing with something. And I think it's different at community sport. I mean, it's often put up as a barrier towards injury prevention. There's always an element of risk. Everyone wants to do it. But I'd like to, to meet anyone who's met a child who says, I'm going to play footy this weekend because there's a risk I might get injured. <laughs> you know, I don't think it features in the minds of people at community sport or kids. So I think it's a very um, important element and it's what make, makes our elite athletes elite and highly competitive. But again, at the community level, I don't think it's there. And, um, and we really do need to, I think, use your example that it's both silly mm. and, and courageous. Mm. Just quickly, yeah. can it get life-threatening in, in some cases with certain injuries? I mean, I don't know in terms of knees, but I guess with concussion, if you, if you have too many? Well, there, there is a risk that's extremely um, light on that you could get like um, a, a burst vessel in your brain. So if you get one of those sorts of injuries in the brain, then that's life-threatening, blood clot, and that can kill you. It's extremely rare, but that's again one of the reasons why we want to err on the side of caution and make sure that that hasn't happened. What lessons, if any, has boxing learned from the football codes in this country? Uh, <laughs> That's a very good question. Is, uh, uh, well, I, it would probably be unfair mm. to comment on boxing from my perspective because I have so little to do with it. So what I know about boxing is probably as much as what you know and that's what I see on the TV uh, and what might get reported in the papers or the media. But I suppose my simple answer would be nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, from, a, from a medical point of view, I just don't get boxing. Now, you know, we'll have a philosophical debate about the whole issue of, you know, is it really a sport? Um, but the, the whole idea of punching someone's brains out so you knock them out, um, I don't understand. So I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Um, I just can't 
uh, can't come to grips with a sport that's designed to knock you out. Um, if it happens in a football game, that's, you know, that's part of the game, it's unfortunate, it, it's uh, unintentional, that's just an impact. But where you're designed to actually achieve something that in other sports we're trying to avoid, um, yeah, that leaves me a little bit, um, leaves me a bit cold. Over to you, Caroline. Yeah. I think that probably one of the things that we can take as a positive for how boxing has evolved has been looking at what the, are called the training and match loads on players. And this governs a lot of what we do in the football codes and other sports too. So players now have to rest for a certain amount of time between bouts. So they can't go out and have a boxing bout every day. They've now got to wait, you know, several months be between bouts to... Um, reduce the risk of long-term damage. So I think there are some positive things. Yes, I agree with Mark. It's a, it's a very interesting sport. But again, it's another good example too that show that helmets alone don't work. Because why do boxers have gloves and helmets? You know, it's the combination of those two that help minimise the, the, the forces to the head. It doesn't prevent it altogether. But it is another good example about why protective equipment is part of the answer, but not all of it. Yeah, I'd, further to Caroline, I think... Um, I, I agree. I think at the very least, I mean, if you're going to try and beat someone's brains out, uh, that you at least have to have a period of time afterwards to recover. Mm -hmm. So there is now the medical advice that they must okay. follow. There are, there are quite strict rules, okay, certainly at yeah. high levels of boxing, where they are required compulsory medical checks, etc. So okay. at, at least we can say, well, you know, if you're going to do that, you, you're getting some sort of medical observation and, uh, uh, and you have to meet certain medical criteria before you can proceed on to the next fight. Mm -hmm. At least that's what that's achieved. <laughs> I'll just give you a quick update. The NFL has changed its rule in the last few years around the helmet, uh, around using your head as a weapon and so on, partly because of the information about brain concussion and partially because ex-footballers successfully sued the NFL for about a billion dollars for that. Um, just recently, ex-players have also sued the NFL because, uh, they were, um, because they were suing them because the doctors were providing them with drugs to help them get over their injury on game day, before games, and after games, without... Uh, recording what they were giving them without uh, telling them what possible consequences are so they would be addicted afterwards. And I'm just wondering, is that something that can happen in Australian sport? Uh, there's always the potential for that. I mean, th this is the difficulty in, in my medical practice uh, dealing with elite athletes is, again, the, the balance between them performing at an elite level potentially suffering an injury and then trying to play with an injury or, or um, return to their training and competing whilst suffering an injury and how we use our medical apparatus and some of those are medications to help them achieve what they want. Um, I, did, I read that article and I mean I was quite astonished. I mean if the, if the reports are accurate, um, one player played with a broken leg and the doctor didn't even tell him he had a broken leg. Or, Examples mm. like that. I mean, that's a fairly extreme uh, mm. e example of what you're saying. Um, but but it, it is a balance, and we have to um, inform the athlete and the player that um, there is a risk with what they do, and uh, the medical uh, treatments that they undertake may increase their risk to, to further injury. And um, uh, again, it comes down to uh, informed consent. Um, so, as you said correctly, that it comes down to the information that the athlete is given. And in some of those American examples, they weren't even given the courtesy of that information, I think. That's an excellent update. Do, do you think there's many rogue, I guess not doctors as such, but people in organisations, especially at the professional level, that really push the boundaries with those things? Uh, with medications or...? Medications yeah, and, look, and lack, know, of in, lack of in, information. In, in, in every aspect of life, there are always a few rogues. Um, the, the other area that we haven't commented on is um, uh, outside the, 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 the traditional medical treatments, there are a lot of ex so-called experts um, who are trying to promote their, their products or their wares or their techniques to elite athletes because it makes them look good and um, it uh, enables them to promote their um, products elsewhere. And so a lot of our professional athletes are uh, very susceptible to people trying to sell things to them. Um, and this, this is where it gets into anti-doping issues as well, where they might take a substance that's been given uh, them to help get over an injury, and then they discover that it's actually a banned substance under, their, under the drug um, mm -hmm. testing protocol. 
Um, so th these days they are so uh, aware of those issues that they dare take any type of medication unless they have it medically cleared. So that's always, again, a, a difficult area that um, we certainly impress upon our footballers and cyclists because the cycling uh, sport has certainly had its um, issues over the years where they don't let anything pass their lips without getting it medically checked. So, so they are, there are potential f problems with uh, doping, but also causing adverse effects from taking certain substances that might actually make their injury worse. This is from guest 795 in our chat roll, and he says, what are your thoughts on the dangers of bumps versus tackles, particularly in junior football? Uh, well, from, from my medical experience in junior football, um, uh, I think the incidence of injury uh, of bumps and tackles is relatively low. I know that at junior football for many years they, um, uh, they didn't introduce tackling uh, uh, or bumping um, and uh, they had to learn it as a school when they got older. Um, and so it, it sort of begs the question, you know, had they learnt that school at a younger age whether they would uh, be able to deal with it when they were a little bit older. Again, Carolyn might be able to comment about any evidence to support supported at junior sport. But certainly in organised sport at a, at a junior level, and we're talking under 12, 13, the impact of those skills in, in, from an injury perspective is, is very low. Yeah, certainly we've done some work in uh, junior AFL where we've looked at how the game changes as children progress up the the different levels of play and when they get introduced to tackling and what we actually found was that tackling wasn't introduced until the under 16s competition thinking that it was against the rules lower down but of course players would unintentionally collide so you have you know five nine-year-olds all running after a ball they might collide so what we worked on with the AFL was we gave them back that advice and so what they looked at was ways to handle the situation so if you do fall in that how do you fall properly you know, to reduce um, the impact of those injuries. So there's other things that can be done. And certainly the AFL, again, has been leading the way in terms of tackling that. So these incidents can happen. It's not ignoring that they can't, but let's give the players the skills whereby they can reduce their risk if they do occur. Um, yes, my, my question is about um, eye injury and um, eye protection in winter sports. But uh, I guess the second part that's totally unrelated um, to do with summer sports like cricket. Um, helmets uh, seem to be preventative in injury and yet I don't want anyone leaving thinking that perhaps that's um, something that uh, having no helmets is, is a wise move. Uh, what's the panel's comments on that? Again, we've done uh, research that's shown conclusively that the incidence of head and facial injuries in cricket has reduced with the introduction of mandatory headgear, particularly for children. Of course, the problem is that it comes to the design of the helmets. So you've got the helmets and you've got the face guard. And if a player can actually um, change the position of the face guard, it increases the opening for protection here. So we've got to have designs that maintain their integrity but also look again at the player behaviours and have the coaches and so forth making sure that the players don't modify their equipment. We know for sports like, not that we have that very commonly in Australia, but um, ice hockey and so forth in Canada and America too, that having face visors is one of the major things you can do to prevent eye injuries. So I think that in those sorts of sports, again, they're different to our football codes. So if we think about cricket and ice hockey, they've got a very hard ball that's a smaller size. Um, and so helmets do have a role in that sort of sport. I, I agree. And your point about eye injury, I think, is quite valid. I mean, the, 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 the traditional sport where there were a lot of eye injuries mm. was in squash. That's right. And um, so most squash players, if they're sensible, wear those protective eye guards. The squash ball is almost like the squash ball was made to fit in the eye socket. It's just that perfect size that it, if it got you right on the eyeball, it, you could have quite a nasty eye injury. So I think um, for certain sports, certain types of protection are, are perfectly ideal. 
And I think squash is a good example of that. And squash is another good example of really bad design because in the 1970s, the first eye guards that came out were just like a frame. Yeah. And you know what the frame did? It sucked the ball in. into your eye more. And so, yeah. yeah, you need to have the visors or the glass ones. So, you know, yeah. not all eyewear is good. And even yeah. some people who play squash think wearing contact lenses will protect them. Yeah. But no, so again, we've still got yeah. to go a little bit further to educate people as well. Yeah. Um, following the discussion on the efficacy or otherwise of helmets, in the heavy, bulky helmets worn in the motorsports, yeah. is there any evidence to show that they are damaging as well as protecting in some instances? Uh, where there has been um, advantages, advantages to design um, developments has been in the area of neck injury prevention because there has been some suggestion that adding the big bulk around there has led to increased strains on the neck. But so we have seen that the manufacturers of those helmets have worked with the, the motocross sports, with the F1 formula drivers and so forth and devised helmets now that address that. So really, th th those elements have been reduced. But again, it's a marrying of, of really monitoring what's happening in terms of injury rates and correlating that with full understanding of the mechanisms of injury. But certainly in those sports, um, there's irrefutable evidence that those helmets work. There, there, there has been some concern in cycling um, in BMX. Uh, the little kids who ride BMX wear those quite, yes. almost like a motorbike helmet. And you see all the, these little bodies mm -hmm. with quite a big helmet on, on a very little neck which in children, they don't have a very well-developed neck musculature, and you, you, you sort of intuitively look and think, gee, that must be a big load on the head. Maybe that would predispose them to neck injury. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence no. to actually say that it does, no, uh, even though it looks like it might. But uh, this, is all, this is part of sporting culture. Um, the BMX culture is you wear a big bikey helmet. Um, so <laughs> it, it may, there may come a day where we we as the medical consultants say to, to the cycling authorities, maybe this type of helmet isn't such a good thing for BMX. Um, and that's just one example. I, I don't think we can sort of confidently say that yet. But that's where things might change in the future. Yep, I would agree. Um, because you have said that helmets perhaps are not at the safety equipment that they should be, psychologically, would people perhaps tackle somebody who was wearing a helmet harder than if they were not? In, in theory, they could, yeah. Um, that, as Caroline referred to earlier, that the, the wearer of the helmet may uh, have some sense of feeling that they are less likely to get injury and so therefore more likely to take on high risk behaviour. And the, the other person who sees someone wearing a helmet saying, oh, they've got protection, I can hit them harder. Um, I don't know if the evidence actually, there's any scientific evidence to show that's how um, the behaviour changes, um, but instinctively you'd think some people might think that. Certainly there are psychological studies that show that those are the beliefs that people hold and the fears. But as Mark said, there's actually no correlation with injury data or in any studies where we have monitored on-field behaviour to actually show that that does actually occur. Hi, my name's Michelle and it's directed at um, anyone who would like to answer this. Um, just with, uh, you know, like American uh, footballers, how they have the big helmets and everything like that, my question is basically, um, with the design of helmets, is that, like, ongoing updated? Because, for instance, I recently bought a new iPhone and I went in there and um, I said, look, I just want to... I'm going to drop my phone, I will, and I just want to find out what's the best thing that I can get that's quite small, that I can fit in my bag, that will protect it. And basically, there's this new design that goes around the phone. It's very thin. It's like a rubber kind of um, de-shattering mm -hmm. kind of component. And, you know, like, I mean, you drop your phone from here and it's supposed to prevent the shattering. And I'm just thinking, wouldn't something like that, like, that's not big and cumbersome and causing, you know, like, being like an arm missile in a sense, but it's sort of like, in a sense, it's smaller, it fits around the head. And wouldn't that be better than nothing at all, is my question? And also, is design being updated all the time to find out new te technology? Yes, yeah, certainly this is, again, another area of impact biomechanics where there's lots of work, and it's the interface between engineering and medicine. One of the things with concussion, as Mark said to start with, a, a large number of the cases aren't to do with direct blows to the head. It might be to do with a whiplash motion or it's because your, your, your brain is, or your head is stable and your brain spins inside your head. So it doesn't matter what you have on the outside, it's not going to help with those. And that's the vast majority. 
We're constantly looking at things like uh, the construction and the chemical composition of helmets, and there are international standards that are being set up so people can know about what guidelines and what sort of minimum standards might protect their head in certain circumstances. There aren't international guidelines, really, for um, the helmets that we wear in Australia. And in fact, the International Rugby Board's um, criteria for headgear is a bit unusual because it says that it's got to protect against these low-level um, impacts, but really heavy forces it doesn't need to protect either. But one of the reasons for that is to protect against the very heavy blows. You'd have to have a helmet like that um, with current technology. So it might be something that we see evolving over time. But really the basic fact is that most concussions are not to do with blows. And so helmets will not work in the majority of cases anyway. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I, the problem with concussion in the human brain is um, the, you know, your, I mean, your um, analogy with dropping the phone it, the, the science is very simple. It's an inert object, uh, gets dropped, hits the ground. The trouble with the brain is um, you've got a moving individual who collides, and again, you think of the Brad Sines where he collided with the player, then he hit his head. There's a massive amount of deceleration forces that the brain suffers inside a very fixed structure of a bony skull. So the dynamics and the impact on that brain are very different from just a blow to the head. And this is the difficulty with trying to find something that protects the brain around the head. And um, I mean, the research is being done, and Caroline uh, knows much more about them. But we still haven't found something that that actually reduces the deceleration forces. I mean, it would be almost like it would be nice to be able to devise a helmet that would fit around the brain inside the skull. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, uh, that's going to be a bit technically a little bit difficult. Um, yeah, that's, how, that's what we're going to have to sort of look at because the simple protection around the head itself is, is not really addressing the issue of these deceleration forces yeah. the brain suffers when it gets an impact. I saw a program about American gridiron and the rates of C of CTG um, because they use their heads and necks as missiles um, and the big bumps get all the applause and all the um, TV pictures and everything um, and they're getting huge rates of CTG um, simply because uh, those helmets don't prevent um, concussion and makes them use them as a, as a weapon as such. Yeah, I think that what we're seeing um, through the media glorification of that in America too, we're actually starting to see a backlash. Certainly parents, but a lot of the public are saying, well, I don't want anything to do with that sport. And there's fear actually that that sport will, you know, die a natural death if they don't do something about that. I think too, um, the other aspect of that sport is it's the real nature of the game is to really go in hard. And I guess coming back to a, a comment that you asked Mark before, you know, the science equation, force equals mass times acceleration. You know, at the elite level of game, we have big players and they run very fast. At the community level, we don't have them running so fast, so the acceleration is lower, so the body mass becomes important. And that's, again, why when we talk about how we comprise teams for junior football, it's really important to match the teams on physical maturation status. So you don't want to have a little scrawny 12-year-old playing against a Tongan boy or, like, the size of a number of these people that you see playing the gridiron in America. And that's, again, another principle behind coaching practices and team selection that is really founded on science for injury prevention. The, the point I'd make about the American gridiron is that, um, as, you, as you say quite correctly, it's part of the sport to use your head as a sort of a battering ram if you watch the gridiron. And the, so there's been a lot of research done that something like uh, um, one of the, um, the backers of a, of a, in a gridiron line will use their head up to a thousand times in a season, hitting mm. their head um, in their in their training and in their games, mm. and so I think we've got to be a little bit careful not to extrapolate that ex American experience with what we have in our Australian football codes. Um, the the AFL data that's released every year and has been done for nearly 20 years now um, shows that on average one or maybe two AFL players suffer an episode of concussion where they miss one game a, a season. So, you know, that's the comparison we're trying to make is 
gridiron players who use their heads almost like a, a boxer gets punch drunk from a number of impacts versus a, a collision impact on one or two occasions in an AFL football season. So I think we also have to put that in perspective that I don't think we are getting anything like the American experience, okay. but unfortunately, because of the American experience, mm -hmm. it's now feeding back and that's why mm -hmm. we're talking about things like, like tonight.